1415 saw one of the most famous battles in medieval history and the climax of a war that saw the deaths of millions. Before it started, there seemed no way the English could win against such odds, but by the end they had defeated the far larger French army. A battle that would change the way that Europe was ruled forever, this was Agincourt. King Henry V is known as one of the best kings to rule over England. His father had taken the throne from Richard II, a man that Henry was probably rather fond of. During Henry IV's reign, the young Prince Henry gained valuable experience fighting rebellions, like the Percy Rebellions and the Glendower Rebellions. Here he gained crucial military understanding and strategies, and met many people who would fight with him years later in France. English kings had claimed the French throne for hundreds of years, as technically Edward III was next in line to the French crown in 1328, when Charles IV died with no heir. The French contested this and instead crowned Philip VI as king. But the English maintained their right to France, even incorporating the French fleur de lis into their coat of arms. So, two years after Henry V inherited his father's throne, the English army of 12,000 set sail from Southampton in supposedly 1,500 ships on the 11th of August 1415, with the intention of taking northern France and marching on to Paris. The number 1,500 comes from contemporary accounts, but this could have been greatly exaggerated and could have been around 500 ships. In addition, the main force may have been 12,000 strong, but it's likely that the fleet carried around 20,000 men, or over, with many being siege specialists, ready to take the rich and heavily fortified port of Harfleur. After losing many men to disease, famine, and the need to leave a garrison at the unexpectedly long siege of Harfleur, Henry marched on, deciding against going to Bordeaux or Paris, but instead marching to English-held Calais. By this time, the English forces had been whittled down so much, the French army was willing to intercept. Both sides played an intense game of cat and mouse, desperately trying to outmanoeuvre each other. The English forces made heroic river crossings, sometimes by a combination of good luck and good judgement, managed to evade the French forces. Right up until the French Marshal Boussicot brilliantly manoeuvred his vanguard in front of Henry. Henry V was trapped and with only 900 men-at-arms and 5,000 archers, the situation was looking dire, as the French forces numbered possibly, but unlikely, 30,000. These two armies finally met near Azincourt. The difference in the mood between the two camps the night before the battle was stark. While the English heard the roaring sounds of party and celebration from the French side, the French, on Henry's orders, heard only silence from the English. Although his forces were partying, Boussico was planning. The normal head-on cavalry charge was out of the question. It had failed too many times, he had to take a different approach. Most of his army would advance dismounted towards the English lines, supported by Italian crossbowmen. While this happened, the mounted forces would go around the English army, charging at the flanks and into the rear. Being attacked at all sides would mean that Henry wouldn't be able to properly utilise his archers and the resulting battle would be a slaughter. On October the 25th, 1415, the weaker army made the first move. Henry V ordered his men into formation at the maximum range of the English bowmen. He ordered these archers to hammer sharpened wooden stakes into the ground in front of them, which would stop any cavalry from charging into the archers and effectively funnel them into the centre, into Henry's men-at-arms, who were far better equipped for melee combat. This march forward was extremely crucial for the English victory. Not only did it put the French on a very slight back foot in terms of being able to control the battle, but it also ruined Boussico's plan. The English army now had woodland either side of it, too dense for any kind of cavalry movement, meaning that his grand flanking plan had failed before it had even begun. In the already divided French forces, this meant disaster. Boussico was undeniably one of very few. He had become Marshal of all France and a knight, risen practically from the very bottom. He was famous for his proficiency while jousting and dedication to training. But he wasn't noble born, he was a black sheep, which means the other French nobles didn't have as much respect for him and were probably even jealous of his success. 
So after Henry marched forward, there was confusion among the French ranks. In the minds of the noblemen, the plan had failed, and the glory was still to be won their way. The dismounted nobles pushed forward in front of the crossbowmen, and when Henry struck first, when he gave the order for the archers to fire to disrupt any shred of order left in the French army and spur them on to a charge, exactly that happened. Any man on a horse charged at the English line, hoping to break the weary English and win the glory before the battle had properly begun. But the battlefield was just that, a field, and it had rained very heavily leading up to the battle. The ground was a sodden mess. The English archers fired volley after volley at the French men stuck in the mud. Any horses that did reach the English archers were either impaled on a stake or torn apart at close range by armour-piercing bodkin point arrows from the highly skilled men wielding the longbows. The horses that could barely move in the field and didn't reach the English line suffered a similar fate, target practice for the archers. When the even slower French infantry finally reached the English, the power of numbers gave in and the English men at arms were pushed back. There was fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, as even the noblest fought for their lives. Edward, the Duke of York, and Henry's brother was killed, and Henry had part of his golden crown from his helmet knocked off. The Duke of Gloucester was wounded on the ground when Henry got to him, and it's believed that he fought directly over his body in a desperate effort to save his life, which he did do. But during all of this, even under the weight of so many adversaries, the English line held. This allowed the English archers to charge through their stakes at the French horde, flanking them. Normally, a lightly armed English or Welsh longbowman would stand no chance against the heavily armoured and highly skilled French man-at-arms, but these men-at-arms were exhausted, confused and squashed up against each other. It doesn't matter how much skill you've got or how big your sword is if you can't swing that sword. There was still a swarm of Frenchmen coming in from behind, so when the men at the front tried to retreat, they couldn't. They were being pressed in, crushed against each other. Many tried to surrender, but they were cut down in the confusion. But, just as the battle was turning in the favour of the English, a renewed French cavalry charge, from the final French line or possibly from French reinforcements, and, at the same time, somebody had managed to get round the woods and Henry's army and led an attack into his baggage train, killing many who guarded it and seriously threatening the English rear lines and left flank. Henry panicked. He had come so close to winning an impossible victory, and yet defeat still remained a possibility. If there were any more French reinforcements on the way, it could surely turn the tide of battle, and maybe his prisoners would take up arms and fight again. Or perhaps he thought his actions would save his band of brothers. Whatever his motives were, we will probably never know. He ordered the slaughter of most of his French prisoners, chiefly the ones who held little importance or ransom value. When some of his men-at-arms refused, either through their wish not to lose good ransom money or otherwise, he ordered 50 of his archers to fire upon the French prisoners. After this, the French attack ceased. The Battle of Agincourt was over. While Henry had lost just 100 or more men, the French lost an estimated 8,000. Henry's band of brothers had triumphed. Henry had beaten all the odds, winning an unwinnable battle. But how? And why did the superior in almost every way French lose? Well, there are three main reasons for that, and the first is the nature of the battle itself. Boussico did have a plan, and it wasn't a bad one, but as soon as Henry pushed his forces into that narrow point, there was no way the plan could be carried out. In addition to this, the ground being as muddy and soft as it was is arguably one of the most important reasons for English victory. Surely such a thing couldn't have been the fault of the French, could it? Well, it turns out it could have been just that. Henry was trapped, there was no real way he could escape from where he was without sacrificing most of his army, which he could not do. The French had the opportunity to choose the battlefield, as long as they were careful and constantly vigilant. Of course, though, they weren't, and because of this, it allowed Henry to make the crucial first move, and this was no accident either. Scouts during the night had told Henry that the ground was the sodden mess that it was, and therefore it is very likely that he moved his army forward with the intention of catching the French off guard, and making sure they were stuck in the field where his archers could quickly and efficiently deal with them. 
His first move of straight away firing at the French line at such a distance to cause confusion and encourage an all out charge supports this. This could have been avoided had the French been making preparations throughout the night and not celebrating a bit too soon. Boutico was crafting his plan, but he was one of the few doing anything the night before the battle, and even he didn't think to scout the terrain of the battlefield, for if he did, maybe he would have held a more defensive stance and tried to bait Henry out. But could all of this really be called a French failing? Henry must have known that his flanks were weak, as his bowmen couldn't really do much against a flanking cavalry charge. He also might have suspected that Boutico would try to outflank him, as he was more than aware that a French head-on cavalry charge had ended in disaster for them at Crecy and Poitiers, so they might change tactic and try something different this time. It's very likely that Henry started the battle the way he did because he wanted to ruin the French plan and create inevitable chaos in the French ranks. He knew that there would be discord in the French army, not least because of the ongoing Armagnac Burgundian civil war, but also because French culture revolved around the idea of chivalry, and every man would be trying to get as much glory as possible, so enticing them into a suicidal head on charge wouldn't be hard. That brings us to another crucial reason for English victory at Agincourt. When the English crossed the channel in August, France was having a civil war between the House of Orleans and the House of Burgundy. At this time France was still heavily using the feudal system, where England had mostly moved out of it. The politics and the culture of the two countries were at first glance similar, but in reality vastly different, with France being far more feudal and religious, and England recognising the importance of the middle classes and skilled workers. The Burgundians preferred this latter option, but on the other side, the Armagnacs wanted to keep the old feudal system. In the years before Agincourt, both sides tried to play their way into good relations with the English, as they still claimed the French crown, and their support could mean victory for either side. The English used this to their advantage, gaining territories and more of both sides trying to keep their neutrality. But when Henry V resumed hostilities, the Duke of Burgundy stayed neutral, meaning that Henry fought a smaller, but still much larger than his, army, which was almost entirely an Armagnac force. For the Burgundians, this meant that when Henry did defeat it, their military capabilities would far outweigh that of the Armagnacs. And that's the problem that France was suffering. While the English troops saw themselves as troops of England, although some of the archers were Welsh, the French didn't. France was divided, split down the middle and in all directions really. The civil war may look like it split France, but in reality it was already there. The civil war just opened it up. So, Henry was taking advantage of a country already at civil war, but the army that the Armagnacs rose to take on Henry should still have been enough to crush him. But the French obsession with chivalry meant that the French army was nowhere near as skilled or disciplined as Henry's army. Chivalry today means um, one's moral compass or, or how much one wants to help others. But back then it was all about the individual, how much the individual could do, how many kills one individual could get in comparison to everyone else. It's, it's not a great mindset for an army to, army to have and it caused disaster. Today knighthood is sealed with a sword being placed on both shoulders, but French knights were knighted with a slap on the cheek, the last blow struck to them that they should not return. It is very easy to see how this mentality can lead to disaster on the battlefield, where one side is fighting to win, fighting to try to survive for himself and his band of brothers, and the other side is fighting to get as many high end kills as they can, and crucially, more than anyone else even if that means pushing your fellow soldiers away in order to secure a kill. The poison of this chivalry also morphed itself into the disrespect for the leaders of the French army. As the French king was in Paris asking to be reinforced with metal because he thought he was made of glass, his son sat by his side, meaning that the commanders of the French army in the minds of the chivalrous nobles present weren't of a high enough rank to command them. Boussico and his co-commander Charles de Albray were experienced and professional soldiers, but try as they might, they were not able to control the higher ranking nobles. This is the kind of mindset that makes an army charge, unthinking, at the enemy when arrows are loose. It's the kind of mindset that makes the nobles and men-at-arms push in front of potentially crucial crossbowmen to get more glory. The kind of mindset that encourages defeat. So if that's the mindset that encourages defeat, what's the mindset and army that wins a battle like this? 
The army that Henry set off with was a relatively large army by English standards at the time. Like the final army, it had a larger proportion of longbow wielding archers than the general men at arms. The English archers were probably the most skilled longbowmen in the world, and this isn't because every single man had been heavily trained at Henry's large expense. The typical English archer was from the social class known as yeomen, below rich merchants but above the upper echelons of the peasantry. Men of this social rank were expected by the crown to own a longbow, arrows, sword and dagger, so when they were called upon at short notice, they could go and fight for their country. But perhaps most importantly, shooting a bow was part of an Englishman's way of life. Every Sunday after Holy Mass, every man between the ages of 16 and 60 had to, by law, shoot at an archery range. Archery was a fundamental part of English culture, and this was heavily encouraged by the men who would use these expert archers to great effect in wars to come. This didn't just create an entire population that was skilled at using the longbow though, it created an entire population that was very strong, far stronger than most people today. Most bows would be around 6 foot, and this seemed to vary depending on who wielded the weapon. But the draw strengths on these were remarkable, a minimum of 80 pounds and most of them would have a draw strength of over 100 pounds, some over 150 pounds. Few men today would be able to shoot one arrow of this bow at maximum capacity, and certainly very few indeed would be able to keep up with the archers who used it at their time, who could fire these massive bows. Archers who could not fire 10 well-aimed arrows a minute were considered unfit for war, and it's likely that the English archers would fire 15 to 20 well-aimed arrows a minute. This kind of firing rate would never again be achieved by the British Army until a couple of decades before the First World War. So what really was this marvel of war, this longbow? The most favourable material for a longbow was you. Now I've managed to find a bit of you in my house in the form of this coat hanger. As you can see here, there are two clear different colourings of this wood, and in effect, this is two different types of wood. This lighter sapwood part being the outer layer, and this darker hardwood layer is on this inner part, as it would be on a bow. The amazing thing about these two bits of wood is that under stress, they act very differently. The inner hardwood of the bow reacts very well under compression and is good at going back to its original shape afterwards. This is all very well and good for the inside or belly of the bow which is being compressed, but the other side, the back of the bow, is experiencing the opposite force, tension. This is where the U comes in handy, because the sapwood which makes up the back of the bow in a U longbow is very good at retaining tension. Both these different things work together to push the bow back to its original shape, and in doing so, throws the arrow forward. This makes for a formidable piece of weaponry, firing from longer distances and punching a deeper hole into plate armour. The man who would wield the longbow is often over-armoured in contemporary artwork or modern interpretations. While he was paid a great amount, the reality is most archers weren't that well equipped in terms of armour. Some archers had no metal armour protection at all, although many would have probably worn chainmail. Plate armour for a bowman was very uncommon, as it prohibited the use of the bow, especially if on the arm or the neck of the archer. The archer was considered to be light infantry, and therefore needed to be as mobile as possible, but if an archer were to wear one piece of armour, it would be a helmet. Even putting a hood on gave an archer a sense of security, if they could not afford more expensive armour. All archers would have some sort of headgear, whether it would be a metal reinforced cap or the more common bassinet or kettle hat. The famous kettle hat offered good protection from overhead blows and supposedly influenced the British Army helmet of World War I. The bassinet, however, made it easier to fire a bow, as there was less in the way when the string is pulled back. While the men-at-arms of Henry's army probably wore visors over bassinets or full-face helmets, it's unlikely that the bowman did, as it lessened that crucial visibility. As a melee weapon, the archer would probably use a short sword or a falcon, but during the battle some archers used the hatchets that were used to cut the stakes, and even the mallets used to hammer them in, because in the hands of a man as strong as an English medieval archer, even a wooden mallet can be deadly. Agincourt is immortalised in Shakespeare's Henry V, a play that perhaps surprisingly did not focus so much on the battle itself, but the politics around it and the people involved. It commended the bravery of those on the English side and made those on the French side seem a little idiotic at times. Shakespeare makes the very important point that the army is British and not just English, perhaps kickstarting a new age in British identity. This obsession with the characters that created the large-scale events, rather than the large-scale events themselves, is typical of Shakespeare. 
helping him mould characters like Sir Thomas Erpingham, for example, who commanded the English archers, and who will be in part remembered thanks to Shakespeare's play. This wanting to see the story of the individuals is particularly prevalent in some of Shakespeare's more fictional plays, the ones that have similar themes like Macbeth or King Lear. They both have a very similar story, and they both play with the idea of civil war, something that had been largely forgotten in modern retellings of the Agincourt story, and they both have similarities to the story surrounding Agincourt. The story of Agincourt is no doubt an epic tale. In the aftermath, Henry and his heirs were recognised as the heirs of France, which led to an albeit short time of England technically ruling over France. It was one of Britain's greatest victories and France's greatest losses. It was an idol for the common man who had just won a proud victory over the contemptuous nobles of France. The battle saw the English take the lead in the Hundred Years' War and the Burgundians take the lead in their civil war. It was a British cultural icon of battle and it changed the way that France saw things forever. Agincourt was a battle that changed history.